This is the last in our six-week series that's called This is a Place Where. Every Sunday morning, we open up with this wonderful proclamation. You spoke it so clearly today. This is a place where, and we go on to define out, speak out exactly what kind of place this is. We've been talking about it as a place where we know that we are having this wonderful spiritual experience, even though we are human beings, that we live in unity and diversity and we celebrate it all. We've been talking about all the different aspects that define who we are as City of Light to bring greater clarity. And today is that last phrase of that statement that you share each Sunday, and that is we live out our calling to be a light for the world, a light of love, truth, and understanding that is making a difference. That's our proclamation. We live out our calling. Calling, what is a calling? Sometimes we get confused a little bit about what calling is. True story. There was an ambulance company speeding down the road trying to uh, get to the hospital on board with someone who was having just all kinds of heart uh, pains and uh, breathing complications. They needed to get to the hospital right away. Unfortunately, there was a woman driving an old Buick in front of her, putzing along, going very slow. And the sirens were going and the lights were flashing and she didn't seem to pay much attention. And suddenly the driver picked up his megaphone speaker and said, please pull over. And the lady pulled over and the ambulance went on, proceeded down to the hospital, got to the hospital, spent some time there making sure that the patient was taken care of. And the ambulance company got back in the uh, ambulance, the drivers, and thought they would proceed back to uh, their home base. And as they did, they noticed the elderly woman was still on the side of the road. They thought, well, maybe there's some problem. Something's going wrong. Well, let's stop over and check out. And I said, ma'am, are you okay? Is everything all right? Oh, yes. I just had this wonderful experience. I saw a light. And then there was a voice that said, please pull over. And I've been waiting and waiting for the voice to say, you can go. And I, The ambulance driver said, oh, please, come on, honey, it's us. We're the ambulance. We're the lights behind. Oh, no, 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 this was the calling. This was the calling of God. I know this, and I'm going to stay here until uh, the Lord has released me. Quick thinking, they got back into the ambulance, turned the lights on, the sirens, and said, you may go now. And she proceeded to drive away. <laughs> what is a calling? Is it the siren and the lights? Is it the voice from on high? Or is it an inner knowing, something that speaks to us within our hearts and our lives? It says, this I know to be true for me. This is my calling. This is what I feel fulfills my life's journey here. This is my purpose. This is what I want to live out each and every day. Here at City of Light, we proclaim we live out our calling to be a light for the world. A light. Sometimes we don't always understand what that is, and we had to really define that, saying, wait a minute, this is who we are. Let me take you back a little bit in history to us. We're going to go back about five years to 2014, where in the, our previous location, we gathered together as your elected leaders, the board of directors, to discuss what is our calling. We began by saying, who are we? Well. We are First Metropolitan Community Church. That was our name back in 2014. We began to say, well, wait a minute. Our name is First, and our denomination is Metropolitan Community Church. First, is that our calling? Is our calling to be first? No, that name was chosen at a time when there were other MCCs forming in the Atlantic community, and there was a need to say, wait a minute, we want to, wait a minute, we want to know that we're the first one. We were the first one. Uh, you may come up, you may rise up, you may form another church, but we're the first. And we asked ourselves, is that really important? Do we need to be the first? Today, there are no other MCCs. They have since closed. And we asked ourselves, is it really important to proclaim first as our name? So we began to say, well, wait a minute, that's right. doesn't really sound like that's our calling. Our calling isn't to be number one. Our calling isn't to be first above all and uh, above everybody else. Our calling isn't that. It, it's something else. And what is it? And we began to think, well, what's the voice of Jesus saying to us but that you are the light of the world? Well, 
That seemed to make more sense to say, we're the light of the world. Well, that's our calling. That's who we are. We're the light. Well, then should we not embrace a name that says something about light? Okay. And of course, then we went with all kinds of things, you know, church of light, cathedral of light, place of light, home of light. On goes the list and going down the list and we say, wait a minute, what does the scripture say? But let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Oh, back up a little bit more. What's that say? That you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before the world that they may see your good works and glorify God. Oh, a city. What was a city? Well, understanding that that city and the breakdown began to unfold for us as we began to picture some sort of activity hub. You know, cities are busy places. We know that here in Atlanta, full of traffic and energy of people coming and going and exchange and commerce. We begin to say, wow, that's exactly what we visualize our community to be. Not a small little farm town, but a mega city almost visualizing us as a place of activity, a place of lots of things going on, a place where we became a city of light. Hence, the name that you voted to choose, to choose a new identity that really began to speak. This is our calling. We feel called to be a city of light. We feel called to embrace exactly what Jesus spoke to us and said, you, 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 me. we're the light of the world. We're the light. Unfortunately, sometimes we struggle with that as we understand, well, wait a minute. If you're the light of the world, well, why don't we just say then, hello, light. Hello, light. Turn to someone and say, hello, light. Hello, light. Yes. We've, we've said, hello, love. Hello, all this other stuff. Well, how about hello, light? Because that's who you are. That's your calling. That's your name. That's your purpose. It's all summarized in that one word, light. Unfortunately, we don't always understand what is light. What is light? Well, we certainly know what light is at five o'clock in the morning when we turn the lamp on and the switch and the alarm's going off and the, oh, that light, oh, pull down the light, you know. Or if you're trying to sleep in on a Saturday and enjoy some good snooze time and the sunlight's coming through the window and you pull the blinds down because light, it's penetrating. Light, what is this thing called light? Now, here's an opportunity for us to engage science and spirituality and bring them together. Because what I want to say here, here at City of Light, we've always believed that science is not in conflict with our spirituality, and our spirituality has never been in conflict with science. Because the logic of God and the logic of science are intelligence that work together. They're not in conflict, and too many times in our world today, we've tried to embrace a religion or a spiritual journey that would say, well, science has its own thing, but God is something totally different and not engaged in science nor in collaboration, and they're in conflict constantly. And we don't believe that. We believe the logic and intelligence of this world is divine intelligence. It is the science of knowing and understanding and comprehension. So what is light? Well, light is this wonderful spectrum. And what are we seeing is this white light, which is the collection of all colors coming together to create this white light. But I want you to know something that in this light spectrum, you're only seeing one one thousandth of the percentage of what light is. Science tells us we're only able to see one one thousandth. That means 99.999% of what light is, we're not even seeing or comprehending with the eye. There's so much more to light than just the white light that we see, which is the collection of all colors forming together. Not just white, but every color of the rainbow coming together so beautifully to create this white light. So when we understand this science, it says, Wait a minute, there's something so much deeper and more for us to see than what we're comprehending with our eye. Why can't we see it? Why can't we see more? Because what happens is we're not able to look within the light. We are comprehending with the eye of a predator. Yeah, an eye of a predator. That's our, what we call our vision, right? It's predatorial vision. It looks, categorizes, examines, does analysis. 
Are you foe? Are you friend? Do I like you? Do I not like you? Who are you? Let me categorize you. Let me put you in a box. Let me formulate something because our mind is constantly looking at one another. We're trying to formulate opinions. And that eye is looking like someone would and do analysis on a prey as if you were a hawk or an owl examining. Do I want to eat that? What is that? I don't know. Oh, snake. I think I'll go down and get it. Uh, or do I want this or that? With the eye that's roving like a predator, trying to do analysis, trying to examine. And so our physical eye is always seeing and trying to do analysis. And we're not able to see that within the light, there is so much more. Science tells us within the light, there's this amazing energy. That's all that you're not comprehending, that you're not. And our problem is we're always looking on the out and not able to look within. And wow, is science ever preaching the words of Jesus? For Jesus says, you are the light. And we go, wait a minute, I'm looking at you and you're not such a light and you're not such a light. You know, you've got, you're just human beings and we're doing predatorial analysis as to who you are and sizing you up and where, you know, what categories and how we relate to one another instead of looking deep within to see we're looking at the one one thousandth of a percent and there's so much more within to be seen within every light. To see the energy, the energy of God at work, the energy of the divine at work, the very power of this energy being very intelligence at work. That's what we're looking to see, to learn, to experience within one another. Say, let me look within because the power of limitation is that we're only looking without. We're looking on the exterior and not looking deep, 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 deep within to see the energy of the divine within you, the intelligence of God at work within you, that your whole life is this wonderful essence of light and energy at work within our hearts and our lives. And so it is that we understand that inside this light is this energy, this intelligence, and you are that. So isn't it interesting that churches would first and foremost want to name you are a sinner? Hmm. When Jesus said, you are the light. Now we all know that we have sinned and made mistakes, but is that our banner that we put over our heads and say, this categorizes who I am. I am sinner. I am one who makes mistakes. I'm one who misses the mark. I am failure. Is that our banner? Is that what we want to proclaim? Here at City of Light, we say that we are the light. And we recognize the light, which is the energy of God, the presence of God, the divine at work, that infinite intelligence to say, wait a minute. I realize I'm in a room full of really intelligent people. Why? Because the divine is here. And the divine is at work. And when we allow the light to shine within us, whoo, y'all are so smart. You're brilliant. Brilliance is what we see radiating from within. You say, well, wait a minute. I'm not all that smart. I've not had all that learning. I didn't have that ed much education. Come on. You know, don't call me so like I'm some sort of city slicker smart. You know, I'm just a country folk and I have just simple learning. Oh, but deep within you is the wonderful wisdom. How many of you have encountered a five-year-old child who could say some pretty smart and intelligent things? Yeah. And we wonder, where did you learn that? What college or university did you go to? Because what you've spoken in innocence and purity is a wealth of knowledge, beautifully expressed in simplicity. You see, deep within us is this wonderful, ongoing intelligence, this powerful energy we call the divine, and it's at work within us. So we need to call it out and recognize it and say, we're a city of incredible intelligence and brilliance, a city of infinite wisdom, a city of great understanding, a city of wonderful acknowledgement of the divine at work within us. Because how different it shifts our whole life journey when we shift from saying, I'm the sinner, to I'm the light of the world. From I'm the failure, oh, that's who I am. I'm defined as the unworthy, to the one who expresses the worthiness, the one who expresses the wonderful love and light and energy flowing within our hearts and our lives, how powerful it is. In all my years of growing up in Kenya, East Africa, one of the things that was so prevalent in that culture was an acknowledgement of energy within someone. It wasn't an acknowledgement of their physical structure, being, stature but it was an acknowledgement of energy within people, being taught to see 
their energy is being sought taught to see the divine work at play being revealed within us. So quite often when Westerners would get together, you know, those American missionaries would come to Kenya. And they would come and say, yeah, well, you know, I'm really impressed with the, the lady who's leading your church and she's doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, which lady is that? Was she tall? Was she short? Uh, you know, was she dark-skinned or light-skinned? What was her hair color? What was, you know, and again, all they're naming are the exteriors and not acknowledging the interiors. And what we find then was a teaching that says, wait a minute, no, she's the one with the energetic spirit. The one with the energetic spirit? Wait a minute, was she tall? Was she short? What, what color hair? You know, what was she wearing? Not knowing that that's exactly how we would really see one another. Because what's the divine energy that I see revealed in you? Do I see the divine energy of compassion, grace? Do I see the divine energy of forgiveness and love? Do I see the divine energy of a wonderful work of joy and of peace? What is it that I'm calling out, that I'm seeing, that I'm recognizing? Because I want to look behind that 1%, and I want to look into the 99.999% uh, of what is even more out there to be embraced. Now think about it. How beautiful this world is. When sunlight comes up, we see the dawn and the early morn. It's gorgeous. Yet we're only seeing a little snippet. How much more beauty is there yet to be seen? So if we were to look within the hearts and the lives and say, you are the light. And I see you as the light. I see the divine energy within you. What we not see more and more of the gorgeousness of who each and every one is in this world? Seeing their inner beauty, seeing their inner joy, seeing their inner peace. You know, I would love it if we could create an environment where we all met each other in a dark room for the very first time having never seen each other, but we're in this blackness, this darkness, and we meet each other for the first time and we become so sensitive to the energy, to the spirit, to the presence of one another. Before we formulated any ideas based on the physical and the exterior, instead of just looking at the outside, looking to see that beautiful light within, even in a room of darkness, listening to one another, hearing one another, sensing and feeling What's the beauty that I see within you? And then turning on the lights and then say, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I saw you as so gorgeous. <laughs> I, you know, and realize that, wait, what I saw was the beauty, not the physical aspect, not the outer shell, but so much more. Here at City of Light, that's what we're preaching and teaching is that there's a divine beauty within everybody. And we're calling it out, naming it, seeing it. And we want you to encourage you to bring it out, bring it out of one another. So what happens is with the great joy is just speak it out. Speak it. Call it. Name it. I see joy in you. I see peace in you. And you maybe you use it in the form of a compliment, but it's the calling forth of the divine energy that you recognize, calling forth the light that you acknowledge that's already present with one another. For this energy then, this light, is really a higher consciousness, an awakening at a higher level. An awakening where you're now moving and operating up on a higher plane, a hill, a city built on a hill, a collective consciousness, an understanding of a body, of a group that has risen to a higher level of understanding. That's who we are. We're a city of light, a community of people who begin to acknowledge, I see more than just the physical. I move beyond the physical in every aspect of my life. And I begin to live and dwell in the spiritual realm. Because let me tell you this. In the physical realm, there's a lot of bumps in the road, aren't there? A lot of limitations, a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulty that we may experience in the journey. But in the spiritual, wow. All things are flowing in divine order. All things are moving in complete and right and perfect time. Everything happens without effort and with great ease. That's the way it works in the spiritual. But we get caught up in the physical and we're only looking at that 1% of the light and not seeing the greater aspect of the light that's available for us to partake and to participate in. 
So what we find is that when we awaken to our calling to be this city, this collective consciousness rising to a higher level of understanding, what happens is you cannot be hidden. There's no way because people see your radiance. They see the beauty. They see your love. They see your grace. They see your compassion. They see your forgiveness. They see your joy. They see all these aspects of the divine unfolded through you. And they can't help but say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You could be trying to, to hide yourself in the corner, but your radiance speaks volumes in a vibrational level that permeates our world today. So it is that this understanding then becomes a self-realization. A realization of who we are, self-realization. We talk about it over and over again, but we want to break that down to understanding that this is who I am. And that when I understand of who I am, I'm this divine expression, then I live it out. I don't suck it in. I don't try to bring it in. I try to pull it in. I try to get it from you or you or you. I discover it's already within. The light is already within you. It's already there. You don't need to go and get it from someone else. Can I get some light from you? Can I get some light from you? Can I borrow something from you? Can I get light from you? You have the light. Just turn it on. Just sort of reveal it. Just sort of unfold it. Just uncover it. It's there. It's always been there for you were created in this likeness and image of God. And that is the light of God in you, already within you. So it's now to stop and just say, wait a minute, I need to acknowledge right now. And today I wake up with the purpose of radiating. That's right. Here I am. I'm just going to radiate light everywhere I go. I'm going to light up the room. I'm going to light up this place. I'm going to light up the space. Everyone I encounter, the grocery store, it's going to be illuminated by me. Oh, the gas station, it's going to be illuminated by me. My coworkers are going, whoa, 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 this is pretty bright light here. I mean, there's been someone's radiating right here. We can feel it, sense it, and know that this is how we're called to live out for our lives. Because what happens is, whatever God teaches you, God gives you opportunities to practice it. Okay? Well, there's a lot of things. Wait a minute. We've learned a lot of stuff in the journey of life. Oh, you've been coming to church here. I've been your pastor for 19 years. We've learned a lot together, haven't we? And isn't it wonderful to know that God gives us the opportunity to practice everything we've learned. Isn't this wonderful? We get a chance to exercise our knowledge. We get a chance to show. We get a chance to reveal. We get a chance to do all these things. I'm so proud of you all uh, as a congregation. Yesterday, we had a beautiful experience here with our indoor yard sale. Remnants are still here. You get a chance to enjoy. But we had a great experience as people came in and inquired about City of Light and opportunities for us to talk about the ministries we do of compassion and care, of education and helping people on their spiritual life and their journey. We had wonderful opportunities of conversations, but probably the greatest practice of what we believe when a Jewish lady from Jamaica came in and she said to me, I'd like to buy some clothes. Can I have all the clothes on the rack? Because I'm sending this clothes to God. And I, there are people in need there, but I'd like to buy all the clothing that you have. Not we had racks and racks of clothes and boxes of clothes that people had donated. We were thinking, what are we going to do with all this clothes? Who's going to want this? We're going to be stuck with this stuff. We'll load it up. We'll send it off to Goodwill. We'll use some for our clothing closet, but we can't handle all of this. And suddenly she began to say, I need this. I want this. Can I just? We said, of course. Here, take this and this and that too. And how about this and a box of that and this and that. And for a simple donation. Oh, she was blessed with so much more because we were generously eager to give, to join her in her calling. Her calling to be a light for those in need in Ghana. To join her in that work and say, here, take this. Take these goods. Yes. Oh, we're not going to price them out 50 cents here, dollar there, whatever. Just take it all and make it a simple donation and go with God's grace and love and peace because we get a chance to practice the generosity of our own hearts and lives at work to be a blessing. Well, it didn't stop there. The next man who walks in happens to be from India and he is uh, working to build homes here in America and rehab, refurbishing, reflipping homes, you know. He's uh, and has a home that he's working on right now and there are some refugees coming from Afghanistan. 
will be arriving next week, I believe, and they have nothing. And he came in and said, can I have all your blankets? Could I purchase them all that I might have them because these refugees are coming as a family and they have nothing? Take the blankets, take this, take that. And here in the spirit of generosity, wait a minute, we're supposed to be having a sale. It isn't our purpose to be making our first million in our garage sale. Uh, we didn't quite achieve that. Uh, so, but we, you know, is that our purpose or is our purpose to be the light in the world and said, here, take this. And as he was loading up boxes of blankets and everything we had, well, wait a minute, I'm chasing after John. Here's two more blankets. Take those too. Take this and take that. You see, it was a spirit of generosity at work that says you are the light that radiates, radiates. We're not nickel diming. We know that God will take care of us financially. We know the fundraiser is an effort to uh, meet the needs of the ministry, but we know God works in multiple ways and not just reliant on that. So it's not about nickel and diming and trying to say, can I get 50 cents for this? Can I get a quarter for that? Can I get a dollar? How about $25 for this and that or whatever? It was more about the generosity of heart at work. To understand that we have the opportunity to live out our calling. You live it out. For you, as God gives you opportunities to practice what you know, practice what you've learned, the life will open up all kinds of avenues for you to actually say, what do I know? I'm the light of the world. Well, how do I shine? Well, uh, I already know how to shine. I know how to radiate. I know how to do all these things. Just let me have the opportunity. And God says, today is the day I've made. Today is the day you need to radiate. Today is the day where you go into the world and shine and be that light. You know, it's not so important to know what you know as it is to show what you know. A lot of people can say, I know that I know that I know, but if you never show, you see, it doesn't speak with great volume. But when we're showing what we know, when we're showing what we believe, it speaks in volumes and in ways and in beyond the words of our limited English language. It speaks and it preaches to us and it reveals something more when you. Show what you know. When you let your light so shine before the world that they see your good works, not for the intention of, hey, look at me, I'm really something. No. But that they may see the light of God in you radiating and give glory to the very source of your being, to very the source of your being, which is the divine, which is God within you. So let me say that we are celebrating now this year 47 years of existence as a congregation. 47 years. Y'all look pretty good for 47. Uh, you know, we've all been here in this wonderful journey of sharing out this message, message and mission of this congregation. And today you can be proud of the way that you have lived out your calling, creating the largest spiritual center in the South. Someone said, where's the next largest one? that I said, I don't know. So is it just the South? Or are you the largest spiritual center in America? Is there another spiritual center that's 36,000 square feet of opportunity for ministry? Is there another spiritual center in America somewhere that's offering all seven days a week programming? Yesterday, there were 250 people who came through our doors in diverse different programs. There were eight different programs going on at the same time in this facility. People learning on the first floor, second floor, third floor. There was a healing workshop. There was a workshop done in Spanish for Spanish-speaking people. There was workshops there that were all about uh, individuals finding comfort and peace through breathing. There were individual counseling sessions going on. There were, we were having a yard sale where all kinds of things were going on. And the parking lot was, Sarah was like, oh, wait, wait we're packed to full capacity and Someone would pull out, and there were two more spaces. Someone would pull in, and oh, now we're full again. Oh, and five people would pull out, and then 10 people would pull out, and then 15 more would come in, and it was just this wonderful revolution of parking spaces going on all day long. And that's our vision. That's why we're here, to create a spiritual center that's seven days a week offering opportunities to, for people to be a light. Well, we are a city. It's not just us alone. And the city is not just this church. But the city is you. You're a city. You're a city. You're a city. You're a city. You are a metropolis, shall we say, 
of the light of the divine. And it is the collective that brings together this wonderful power and energy that enables us then to live out our calling. But let me tell you this, don't forget it. Don't forget it. I don't think any of us are elephants, and they say elephants never forget. So we're human, and we have a little propensity to sometimes forget who we are. Now, the Bible's full of stories, and there are stories. They're your stories. So today, the Bible speaks to us. Here's your story. Your story is in the form of Samson, a prophet, one who is chosen to be a light for the world and whose mother was told, don't even have any wine in your birthing process or, to, or in uh, all of your life sustained from any kind of alcoholic beverages because your child is going to be a very special child. And as Samson was born, the story goes on, and your child should never cut its hair. So it's going to have really long hair. Well, so Samson, having never had a haircut, had probably very, 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 very split ends or uh, uh, long hair. Yeah. So what we find here is this one who is now with great strength. Now we look at why the hair and what's the big deal and why are the Bible writers incorporating long hair? But hair spoke of an energy. Hair spoke of a consciousness and awareness a life energy that was radiating from the head in symbolism of the energy of knowing your calling and your purpose. Knowing, and it was symbolic of reminding the, him of his calling to be this prophet, to be this one who would be a leader for all of Israel. And in his might and power and in all of his strength, Samson was known for his muscle and coming in to help defeat the enemies and to destroy all kinds of challenges or obstacles that came against the children of Israel. And in his power and might, he became great. And the Philistine community, the adversarial or enemy community, constantly wanted to get together to figure out what's the secret? What's the secret to his great strength? Now, Samson had a propensity for beautiful Philistine women. He had already dated two, relationships didn't quite work out, and now he's into his third girlfriend. Her name is Delilah. And they got with Delilah and said, Delilah, we're going to give you some money. Some say it's the equivalent of about $4,000 is what they tried to give her. Back in those days, can you imagine, based on inflation rates of what 4000 is today, that was probably about $4 billion. And she was like, I'm up for the challenge. You bet. I'll get his seat. I'll use all my womanly charms, all my feminine ways. I'll get that secret out. She began to inquire, and he gave riddles and rhymes and all kinds of things to her, and, and she would tell the enemy, and, the, and that wasn't it at all. And then she, oh, she'd be mad. Samson, you didn't tell me the truth. Why didn't you tell me the, innocent, the real truth behind all this? Then she he would tell her something else, and, oh, I got the secret now. I got the secret She'd tell the Philistine army they would come in and, and he would muscle up and defeat everybody and destroy them. And oh, this went on and on and on. And you know the story. It's your story, after all. It's your story because you are the Samson. And your hair may not be floor length or full of split ends, but your hair is symbolic of your consciousness and an energy of your calling and awareness that you are the light of the world. And yet sometimes we forget. And in a moment of weakness, Delilah has now lured Samson. If you love me, if you really love me. And you know, when women cry, what are you going to do? Come on, guys. We all know that. You know what I mean? Oh, please don't cry. Just don't cry because oh, like, you make me feel miserable now. The power of tears just would just kind of break down Samson's heart. Okay, I will tell you, it's just if you cut my hair, I lose my strength. If you cut off my consciousness, you cut off my energy, if you cut off my awareness, I lose my strength. That's really what he was saying. But he just said, I don't go to a barber, have you noticed? I don't go for a haircut. You know, shampoo and a rinse maybe, but that's it. I don't really get a haircut. So he falls off to sleep, and some feel it was even in her lap that she just gets out the scissors and gives him one of those high and tight 
you know, little fruit cut flat tops, you know, that military look, you know. And suddenly wakes up Samson and the Philistines come in and they begin to think, and Samson begins to expend all of his muscles and thinking, I've got this power and might, and it's gone. It's gone. And he's a weakling. And he's captured by the Philistines and taken off to prison and his eyes blinded. And there he sits and rots in a jail and begins to remember. And his hair grows. And he remembers, this is my calling. Oh, I remember now. And energy begins to rise up within him. Though blinded and handicapped by it and with an inability to see the physical world, I believe what happened for him now was for him to focus completely inward and to see the spiritual world within him. And sometimes we have to have these experiences in our life to be a little bit blinded so that we would look elsewhere, blinded from by the circumstances of griefing and challenges and problems to look, wait a minute, I got to go within. Because it's called what we call crisis Christianity, where as soon as there's a problem, everybody's Call the pastor. Quick, call the pastor. I haven't talked to him in. What is his number? Oh, what's his name? Oh, yeah. Call the pastor now. Call the pastor because we don't. We got. Uh, let's get back to that church. What church? Oh, I don't know, but that church, it's down on the road. We've been there. We're members, you know. You know, we go once every 10 years. You know, we show up, but we're in crisis now. And suddenly then we remember, oh, I need to turn to God. In that jailhouse experience, blinded, Samson goes, I need to remember my calling and the hair grows and the hair grows and the hair grows. And one day the Philistines gather together and say to him, Samson, we want to pull you out and parade you in front of a big banquet hall and laugh and scoff and spit at you because you were once the almighty Samson and now you're nothing, a little puppy. Samson agrees and comes out of the prison cell but says to the jail, uh, jailer, place me. Are there not two, like, big pillars that support this room? Place me right in the center of them. Oh, perfect limelight for us to laugh at you. Great space for you to be placed. Wonderful place. And in that moment, Samson remembers his calling, his energy, his strength is there, and he reaches out, and he pulls those pillars down, and the roof collapses. And it... In the end, it was a great victory. Now, we may look, wait a minute, that sounds like a terrible story. It sounds like a story of God destroying people and lives. It's a story of our lives full of symbolism, that you are the Samson, and when you forget, sometimes you'll go through trials and tribulations or challenges to help you remember, and when you remember, oh, you are an overcomer and a victor over any obstacles symbolized by those Philistines. So we find it in is that what happened is he remembers his calling and what happens is the light goes back on in Samson's life and the energy is flowing and that energy is divine light. That energy is divine knowing. That energy is divine consciousness, understanding. That energy is a divine awakening within him and suddenly he has all the power. And so too for you, city of light, individuals, congregants, and collective community, let us not forget them. Let's not forget our purpose to radiate, to shine, to be brilliance in the world, to show the world that which we know, to speak to the world not in arrogance, but let them see through our actions, our words, and our deeds that the light and love of God is at work within us. There's a beautiful song that's sung by a contemporary artist. It's, she sings the phrase, are you ready to be what you came here to be? Are you ready to be what you came here to be? This is the acknowledgement of, wait a minute, what am I doing on this earth? What did I come here for? Why am I dwelling in this time? Why, why, why am I here? Why am I living this life? Oh, you came for a divine purpose. The real question is, are you ready to be what you came here to be? You came here to be the light for the world. You came here to be a light that illuminates someone else's pathway. Did you forget it? Did someone cut your hair? Did you forget it and lose your power and strength? Did you lose that awareness? Because it's time to reawaken it and say, I am ready to be what I came here to be. 
I came here to be a light, a revelation of the divine. I came here to be a soul that is filled with the goodness of God and fully aware of it, able to radiate and be an energy presence that touches the lives of the world around us. But today, this is a place where we live out our calling to be a light for the world, a light of love, truth, and understanding that is making a difference. Amen.